It's a pleasure to be here today, October 27th in the afternoon, with three participants in the ongoing conference on inequality and post-transition and emerging economies going on at IZA right now. And these folks are probably pretty exhausted since the conference has been, on. It's been going on for good grief, probably 10 hours already, although I can't believe they were all there since they're all in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, but nonetheless, they've agreed to be here with me today to talk about their papers, which I think are among the most interesting being given at the conference. So let me introduce them. We have with us uh, Johanna Fajardo Gonzalez, who is in the UN Development Program currently just across the way from me here in New York City. Uh, we have Jean Lafortune, who is at the Pontifical University of Chile in Santiago de Chile. And we have Gustavo de Souza who is at the Chicago Fed, right down in the loop in Chicago. Anyway, folks, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure to meet the two of you and to see John again, who I've seen many, many times. Let me ask first question to Johanna, and that is and it's really a neat paper. I mean, it really covers the entire world. It makes sense for the UN people to be doing. Uh, it shows that there was a substantial increase worldwide in poverty during the pandemic. And my question is, there was also an awful lot of effort by governments to solve poverty problems. I gather these failed. They weren't enough. Why or why not? Why weren't they enough? And where were they in countries? Were they enough? What was the difference there? Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and, uh, and the other panelists. So let me summarize very briefly uh, our paper. So we use a counterfactual approach to estimate uh, the likely increase in poverty induced by the pandemic during the first part of the pandemic between 2020 and 2021. And we estimate that uh, the number of people falling into poverty likely reach about 107. 17 million people at the uh, extreme poverty line of 190 a day. Uh, we $1.90 see those, a day? Uh, dollars a day. One $1.90 a day. Yeah, that's the uh, poverty line uh, for extreme poverty measurement. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and we see that the bulk of these is accurate by low income countries and lower middle income countries. About 91% uh, of these increase out of extreme poverty, with 70 million of them alone living in South Asia. So the hardest hit region uh, was South Asia, as per estimates. Uh, we, for, for these estimates, uh, we use data for uh, 160 countries, uh, and we use also data uh, for, for, uh, using uh, the PubCalNet uh, tool. Uh, that the World Bank has put together. So we recover the distributions uh, from this website. So uh, uh, for this specific question of cash assistance, uh, we uh, use data from uh, 41 countries for which we have a complete data. We use the Gentilini and co-authors data set uh, where uh, they provide a very comprehensive summary of all the social assistance and social protection measures adopted during the pandemic. And, and we find, <laughs> that uh, the poverty uh, the poverty was likely mitigated uh, by by these uh, social protection measures adopted by these 41 countries how much how much worse would it have been if they hadn't done anything so yeah yeah so we estimate that uh, 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 we mitigate uh, these measures mitigate, mitigated about a, a 30, an increase in poverty of 70 or 37 million people so it's about so, one fifth uh, yeah, using the extreme poverty line. Yeah, so it was it was very su substantial, but this is looking uh, at all countries, the 41 countries together. Uh, but uh, uh, as well, we see a lot of heterogeneity here. Uh, most of the countries uh, who uh, were more benef uh, benefited for, from these decrease in poverty were uh, uh, upper middle income countries. And some uh, we only have five, uh, high income countries in our in our data set. Most of our countries are uh, uh, low and, uh, and middle income countries. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the 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 these social protection measures didn't mitigate uh, the poverty increase in, in in the in the lowest income countries. This unfortunately, is, let me interrupt. Let me say this is not this is not encouraging. Okay, I mean no, I would have thought with all the efforts, uh, it would have done better. What if, you, if one uses a slightly higher poverty cutoff? 
same yeah. results or same each, results or? yeah yeah so yeah yeah but any poverty line we find similar results the lower uh the low income countries uh were, were, uh weren't able to mitigate the poverty increase as well as uh open middle income countries and high income countries in our data set so yeah that that that's very discouraging however we should recognize that government's efforts were valuable in the sense that the the still they prevented for in, further increases in poverty uh, and 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 we consider that one of the potential reasons for this, although we we don't show this uh, with the data that we have available, uh, uh, one of the reasons for that is fiscal space. So that's the key difference between uh, higher income economies and low and lower middle income countries, because uh, the other economies, the the higher income economies, have a better fiscal um, financial capacity to cope with crises like this. Uh, so, so let me say this then, is it a fair inference summing this up that the glass is one-fifth full and four-fifth empty? Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think that's a good a good way to put it together. Yeah, because uh, we believe that uh, 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 there are a lot of restrictions for low-income countries to have the fiscal capacity, the fiscal space, to be able to fund uh, social protection programs that actually uh, support the most vulnerable uh, groups in, in, in these countries. Uh, so uh, there are other papers out there, uh, including uh, one written uh, uh, by the uh, UN, UNU Wider, uh, where, yeah, they recognize that the fiscal uh, feasibility was, was one of, of the main constraints that uh, the, uh, that make it more difficult for income countries to, to protect more the, their most vulnerable populations. And, and we tend to agree with that, uh, although okay. we would be very good to see with proper uh, country level data um, and proper analysis, uh, what's the the actual reach of for the fiscal space. and. Yeah, and, and there is a lot of discussion out there on how to make social protection systems that are sustainable, and financially Thank sustainable in the future. Mm -hmm. This is a sort of a, your paper is sort of broader in the sense it deals with household poverty. John's paper is a real labor economics paper. And I was very interested in this being a labor person, being ICA is the study of labor. And you know, I've accepted throughout the last 10, 12 years, except for one person who disagrees, a good friend of mine, Jenny Hunt, that uh, there's labor market polarization in most rich Western countries. And you find nothing like that in Latin America? Why? Um, <laughs> so this was this is actually a shocking uh, graph. The first time we started with Chile being, uh, you know, a home base and everything. Uh, and, the you know, we first saw our horizontal flat line in our graph and we were like, there must be a mistake. You know, this this cannot be. Uh, and then we repeated it for the rest of the big economies in Latin America. And we continue to find the same thing. So um, basically, we can go back to what is the source of that polarization and rich countries. Um, and and there's, there can basically be two reasons why we don't see it in Latin America. The first one being that uh, Latin American countries do not ex adopt the same technology as richer economies. And so uh, because they don't ex adopt the same technology, we don't see the same pattern in the labor market. But we do show that the occupations that are suffering more in Latin America are occupations that are routine intensive, uh, as in richer economies. So that doesn't seem to be at least the full picture. Um, but then the other reason, so what do you need to get polarization? You need routine occupations to disappear and you need these routine occupations to be in the middle of the distribution. That bank teller clerk, that line, you know, auto production worker that is disappearing and being uh, uh, replaced by higher or lower uh, ranked occupations. And what we're seeing is in Latin America, first of all, there's less concentration of these routine occupations in the middle of the distribution. They're more spread out throughout the distribution. And then the second thing that seems to be happening is that when these routine occupations are replaced, they're replaced by uh, uh, other occupations that are non-routine, but that are in the same kind of wage uh, range. 
And okay, so, let, me um, let, me let me interrupt. So what you're saying is that in the future, even as more and more routine occupations are replaced, we're still going to find the same non, same lack of increase in polarization. I, mean, I would go further than that. This is okay. this is telling us that uh, it's not obvious that technological change in rich or in poor economy, even it replace routine occupations, will necessarily lead to polarization. It did so in a organization, an economic organization that had some characteristic where those jobs were in the middle of the distribution. It's not necessarily going to be the case when lower income countries, for example, become a, a adopters of this technology or in emerging economies uh, like most of the big countries in Latin America. Okay. What if, uh, presumably you've looked at Chile, you said, I assume Argentina, Brazil, right? Uh, Argentina has... Uh, not the most reliable data. So we excluded Argentina, but we have Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Okay, so Peru is the smallest of those and certainly the poorest. It is the poorest. So what, do you find a difference in Peru compared to the others in your findings or is it the same story? It's, uh, it's as uh, flat uh, in terms of pattern. Um, but it does have some differences. Um, it, it did adopt way less routine uh, replacement technology than the other countries. So it, it, it does indicate that there is a difference also by income level and by development level on this adoption of technology. Um, but for Brazil, for Mexico, for uh, Chile, uh, they are all on the same path of development as richer economies and are replacing uh, their technology with routine task replacing technology. Okay, what if you compare the richest of these countries, which I assume is Chile, to the poorest of the European countries like Portugal, Portugal. which GDP per capita is probably not that much different than Chile's. Same difference in results, or does Portugal look like Chile? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the the study, I believe, of uh, Goose et al. does include Portugal, so we could look at that in more uh, details. We haven't done that. Okay, I do need to look at that. Your other finding is about the minimum wage, and I hate to get involved in the perennial minimum wage wars, which have been going on since I was a grad student at least. Okay, but you show that a higher minimum helped low wage workers. But so let me rephrase cost... this. <laughs> okay, I don't want to misquote you. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, what we show is that in the region, there's been a higher percentage increase in wage for initially lower ranked occupation. So um, this is very similar uh, for when we think of, of the world's income distribution. Uh, in the recent uh, uh, decades, the, the, uh, the percentiles that have seen the highest income growth are the 20th to the 80th. So in our data, it's actually the lowest uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the income distribution based on the occupation. And part of this uh, seems to have been helped by very substantial increase in the minimum wage over that period in uh, Brazil, in uh, Colombia, and in, in Chile uh, that have the biggest uh, increases. Now, uh, can this have negative impact on employment? For sure. Uh, okay. We Good. are Thank conditioning you. on unemployment, so we do not necessarily see this. What we can see is uh, a, a bigger problem than an unemployment with minimum wage in Latin America is informality. So a very uh, if, if the minimum wage increases too much, I can move my uh, employers to the informal sector and uh, stop you know being under the, the minimum uh, uh, wage restriction. And so what we're seeing is actually for most countries, except Chile that has a much smaller share of the uh, uh, labor market that is informal, um, the increase in the minimum wage would have predicted even bigger uh, change in the income distribution than what we're seeing. So clearly there are some employees who never got the benefit of the minimum wage because they were in the okay. informal sector. 
Interesting. Let me move on to Gustavo, who has certainly the most policy-oriented paper here, I would say, and discussing something I've never heard of, namely a country taxing the introduction of foreign technologies, which I find rather amazing. And he shows that uh, this leads to lower employment of high-skilled workers and lower earnings for them. I'm not surprised about the lesser employment, since I assume foreign technologies are more high-skilled intensive, right? Yes. That's a reasonable assumption. But I would expect that the tax would induce more employment among the low-skilled. Yes. It does it or not? No, it doesn't. So Why? Yes. So let me answer that. So, okay, before uh, I answer your question, I need to make a disclaimer that everything that I say today, that's my opinion. That's not the opinion <laughs> of the Chicago Fed, not the opinion of the Federal Reserve System. Now, now that that's out of the way, so let me answer your question then. So the main takeaway of my paper is that if the government introduced barriers to the adoption of these international technologies, that will lead these firms in these developing countries to come up with their own technologies, but that will lead uh, to a drop in GDP because this technology that they are coming up with, they are of, they are of lower productivity, and they will increase the expense to share with low skilled workers because this technology they are biased towards low skilled workers. So, I do agree uh, with you that this national technology of developing countries, this international technology, they probably differ in many dimensions. And one of these dimensions that they probably defer is also in their labor intensity. But the main empirical finding of my paper is that when these firms are making this technology replacement, they change from international technology to a local technology that they come up with, employment goes down. There's a level effect. And the way they explain this level effect, this drop in employment, is because this technology they're coming up with, they're of, they are of such a low productivity, they're of such a low quality that uh, TFP goes down at the firm and firms decrease the employment. So even you know, though- Let me stop you. Why, so yeah. why does employment have to go down? Couldn't the wages either not rise sufficiently or actually fall so that employment stays the same or rises? Yeah, so uh, this is a effect at the firm level. So let's think here that wages are constant. So the firm is too small to affect wages. And employment does necessarily didn't have to go down. Just in the data, it says it goes down because this technology that they're coming up with, they are of very low productivity. And you can actually get some external evidence for that. If you look at citations of these patents that Brazilian firms are coming up with, you're going to see that they have much less citations than this technology that they're adopting from outside of Brazil. So it seems that if the government creates these barriers, TFP is gonna go down because the government's actually creating barriers to the adoption of high quality technologies. And then firms come up with low quality technology to replace them. But what about the industry locally that produces these technologies, which beforehand wouldn't have been so successful? Doesn't that create some offsetting employment increase? Yeah, so if you think about the scientific sector in Brazil, yeah, those could potentially uh, be benefited. But when you look at the data, one thing that's very interesting is that to produce these new technologies, you actually need very few workers. So a firm that produces one patent, two patents per year, we're gonna see that that firm has like three, four scientists being hired. So creating new technologies, does not seem to be something that is very labor intensive. And uh, at the end of the day, what really matters is what is happening to factor workers, to the guy that is operating those new technologies. And it seems that the main driver here is the fact that these new technologies are of very low quality. Okay, let me ask one final question then. Yeah. Should a country, a developing country, or a middle-income country like Brazil, adopt this kind of taxation? Yes or no? If they should? Yes or no? Should they or they shouldn't they? No, they should not. They should. Uh, the government should not impose barriers to the adoption. 
of high quality technologies. So I think these developing countries have the opportunity to free ride innovations created by the developed world, and they should do that uh, as much as they can. Okay. It's nice to get a straight answer from an economist. For those who are listening, I trust you realize what an unusual event this is. Thank you, Gustavo. Let me move now to asking everybody, and I'll start off with Jean asking a question. Uh, very clearly, income inequalities increased in wealthy countries. What about transition economies or developed econ developing economies? What's the answer on that? Just a factual question. Uh, so in in uh, many developing countries, uh, inequality is higher, um, but it has not increased. Uh, so most patterns that we see is either flat or decreasing. decreasing. That doesn't mean uh, in, in some regions. So this doesn't mean that they're becoming uh, Europe, uh, but they started usually from, from high and they are uh, slowly decreasing. That would be at least my, my view for Latin America as an as a overall region. Everybody is nodding, so I won't bother sending that around. What do you think is going to happen to that lack of that trend, which I view as a positive trend, over the next quarter century? Gustavo, you want to talk about that one, or yeah, I can I can try to answer that. So, so I think it depends a lot on what you think is driving this this decrease in inequality in these developing countries. So some people are going to argue that it's that, that is not actually true. What's happening is just we don't have good quality data. Uh, I believe, and uh, I think looking at Brazil, this is uh, some impression that some Brazilian economists have that the drop in inequality is coming because we finally. Uh, put an end to hyperinflation. And now that prices are more stable, inequality has been decreasing. My hope is that I see this, some of these countries in South America are implementing more market-oriented policies, are opening for international trade, and, and at the same time, adding some social security uh, for the, uh, and transfers to the bottom of the income distribution. So I believe that if we keep this pace, uh, inequality be keeping going down in the past in the next few few years. We'll see what happens in your home country on Saturday, won't we? Yeah, we are going to see what happens. <laughs> For those who aren't aware, the second round of the Brazilian presidential election, which I view is extremely consequential. Yes, probably agrees is taking place in two days from now. Let me go on and ask Joanna, who studies the entire world, <laughs> uh, what's your prediction for the next quarter century in these countries? Well, uh, I, I agree with Gustavo. That really depends on the initial situation of the countries and the regions where they are. So if, for instance, we take Latin America, uh, what we see is like uh, the big pattern is like, you know, uh, income inequality declined for the first part of, of the 2000s. And then uh, after that, it, it, it kind of stagnated. But the key facts here is that declining income inequality uh, in Latin America is due mainly to the reduction on wage gaps that were made possible by the spread of secondary education enrollment mainly. Uh, also, uh, drive towards reducing informal employment, which is still a, a, an ongoing situation there, but informality has been having a, a, a downward trend, uh, although not enough. And, and I have to make a disclaimer too, this is my own opinion and based on, on, on the evidence, <laughs> right? Uh, also, uh, there are also a, uh, uh, increases in social spending. So for instance, the famous programs in Mexico, Brazil, uh, uh, the cash transfers have also uh, made these uh, declining income inequality possible in, in the region. And I believe we can uh, say something like that for other regions. My expertise is not so so high in other regions, but I believe it's important to consider the, the, the social spending on education, healthcare, and also labor market policies as one as the main factors that have being uh, either uh, they, uh, relative, uh, directly or indirectly related to uh, declining or or at least not increasing income, in, income inequality. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask now one question with a short answer from each of you, starting with Gustavo and going to Joanna and then Jean, okay? We had the pandemic, as Joanna showed, it raised poverty levels, 
five years from now, will we notice anything about the effects of pandemic on income distribution five years from now? Gustavo? Yeah, I believe so. I believe so. These effects tend to be persistent. It is going to affect the type of education that people take. It's going to affect the type of technology that firms adopt. It's going to affect the type of technology that firms innovate. And those things tend to be persistent. So I do believe that five years from now, the labor market, most in developing countries, it's not so dynamic that we can readjust and uh, uh, reshuffle people around in a way that we revert uh, everything that happened from uh, from the pandemic. So I think we, there, there is still some stuff there. That's depressing. Joanna? Yes, I, and, I, and I agree with Gustavo. Uh, so if anything we, we can, I can say from, from the paper is that these effects of, of a social protection measures adopted during the pandemic have very short-lived effects. And I, I believe uh, we will see longer-term consequences, particularly in uh, human capital. Uh, uh, yeah, the school closures, and you, you're probably very aware of the situation, uh, you know, learning losses, not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries. So this is going to have long lasting consequences. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Jean, any finishing comments on that? I'll be even more pessimistic. We will still see fewer women in the workforce five years from now because of the way that the pandemic uh the weight that it put on uh, women workers to continue uh, the labor of care without that care economy being available. So learning losses, uh, very, uh, I think that will be very serious in particular in developing country. And I am still worried about the recuperation of female employment uh, over the long run. Well, on that very unanimously depressing note, let me thank all three of you for being here today, and I wish you all well on the rest of the conference, which starts again at some early hour tomorrow morning. Thanks a lot, folks. Take thank care. Thank you, everyone. Take care.